I'm Scarlett Fu with Bloomberg Quick Take, Bloomberg Radio, and Bloomberg Television. Welcome to the latest edition of Cornell Tech at Bloomberg, the speaker series in which I sit down with leading figures in global technology, entrepreneurs, investors, as well as thought leaders. And our goal is to bring you engaging conversations to produce new insights and also raise compelling questions along the way. You can catch up on our prior episodes by checking out the Inside Bloomberg page on YouTube and also streaming our podcast, Cornell Tech at Bloomberg, which is available on all major platforms. Now, in this month's edition, we are joined by Karen Seidman Becker. She is CEO, Chairman, and co-founder of Clear. This is a secure identity platform that you can find at airports, sports arenas, and now hospitals and restaurants. Karen, thank you so much for joining us today. Great to be here. So I'm going to go a little bit off script here because I know you spend a lot of time thinking about and optimizing ways to verify your identity so that you can get into a building, go somewhere, and prove that you are who you are and take care of your business. So talk about what it was like to enter this building today versus entering a building last year at this time before vaccines were um, available everywhere and what it could and perhaps should look like in a year from now. So we'll start by saying I love Bloomberg, but you know, you both had to read the directions a lot to make sure that you knew what you were doing, that you had pre-filled out a portal with your identity, that you had gotten a username and password to reflect your identity. You came, you um, had to show your ID, take a picture to then get a the QR a code and mm -hmm. connect, get a rapid test, go over, get a great rapid test, and then uh, you know re-enter and, and connect that rapid test to your identity. And so what is the foundational word I keep using there is identity, right? That I am Karen, I'm supposed to be here today, and that in fact I tested negative. And those are different attributes connected to me. And what I hope it is, and what we're working on is that I, you know, used my face and I'm already connected. My face is connected to my ID, which is just a piece of my identity, which is connected to your visitor management system and also connects to potentially a test I took last night or a test I took here. And I use my face to enter the building to ensure that I am me, I'm supposed to be here, I'm negative, and I have access to X floor. So something that takes if we're lucky, 20 minutes right now could easily be done inside of a minute with a swipe and on your phone. Yes. Okay, if things go well and if we pro continue progressing in this direction. Absolutely. You, how many times do you have to prove who you are and that you, know, you should be someplace, whether it be at a doctor's office, at a hospital, at a sporting event, or into a building? Yeah, day in and day out. It's uh, multiple times I've lost count. I wanna go back a little bit here because we usually, try to get our future guests to open up a little bit and tell us about their background and uh, delve into like what made them who they are. And some of our previous guests like Rob Locasio of Live Person kind of knew that they always wanted to be entrepreneurs and start their own companies from a very young age. You were actually looking more towards another field, broadcasting, and it was sports <laughs> broadcasting specifically, right? That is right. I grew up in Washington, D.C., an avid Redskin fan in the 80s, and so it was nothing but joy. <laughs> so you were looking to do that. You ended up going to University of Michigan. You graduated with a political science major. I did. Um, but you didn't go into sports broadcasting. Instead, you went into finance. How did that come about? So uh, I was a proud and am a proud Wolverine and went there both because of the great academics, but also the sports. I wrote for the Michigan Daily. And then when I went home to, I'm from Washington, D.C., or the suburbs, I worked at a radio station, then I worked at a TV station. And while logging baseball tapes, I also worked on the presidential campaign in 92 and the economics packages and really started to understand um, the power of economics and politics and how the two connected and became really interested in business and finance. And so as I went back to Michigan, I was doing more. I actually did a big research project on the bottled water industry, which was not a thing in 93 and uh, loved finance, loved companies, loved understanding who ran them and what the future was and then how the dollars and the business model reflected the vision and it was an extraordinary combination of everything that I loved. Okay, so you jumped into finance and you worked at a couple of different firms before you then ended up starting your own hedge fund. Tell us a little bit about your fund specific thesis and how you think that set you up for what you ended up doing now. 
So we named our fund Ariant's Capital, which is the combination of the words art and science, which is how I have always looked at the world and continue to look at the world as the CEO of CLEAR. It's both the qualitative and the quantitative, mm -hmm. and we invested in a broad spectrum of industries from uh, subscription-based businesses like cable, satellite, and wireless to turnarounds, but Apple, and Amazon and Priceline were all turnarounds in 2002 and 2003 to the steel industry. And it really invested in management, invested in free cash flow and the optionality that free cash flow created in mm -hmm. businesses, but most importantly, what these businesses could be out five to 10 years and how they might change the world and the business model that came from that. So it was an extraordinary front row seat, not to sports games, but in fact to incredible leaders, sometimes terrible leaders, mm -hmm. and the blossoming and transformation or collapse uh, of businesses and industries. Well, speaking of collapse, you shut down the fund uh, when the financial crisis hit and the economy almost collapsed uh, during the great financial crisis. A lot of your peers in finance took that time to go to business school. You did not go in that direction. I'm curious about why that is. I did not go to business school. Uh, I was looking and thinking that there would be really interesting shakeouts to come out from 2008. There and you didn't want to be stuck in the classroom at the time. <laughs> uh, no, I think I'd also that time had passed. I was a mother of three young children. Mm. And I loved watching management teams of different backgrounds build businesses, build culture, and then the outcomes that came from that. And I thought, I can do that. Um, and so I thought that there'd be interesting businesses to come out of it. So we started a firm called All Good. Uh, holdings, which stood for allocate capital, grow organically, or divest, which is what we thought companies should do with capital, but also stood for doing good by doing right. Mm. And I definitely, as a mom of three young kids, as someone who had lived through 9-11, and it definitely transformed the way I looked at the world and what I thought my place was in it, wanted to buy a business that made a difference in the world, mm -hmm. and what I thought was control cash flows and, and build something that made a difference. Okay, so what happened was that you turned this crisis into an opportunity. And, and we joked about how your middle name is almost crisis because <laughs> you've gone through several of them and, and you look at them as opportunities to pivot. Clear was an opportunity. Now, it was already in existence. Uh, Steve Brill, the guy who founded Court TV, had started this company after 9-11, basically verified passengers' identities and allowed them to skip the TSA line at airports for an annual fee. And there was a little card that people got uh, for, that, for that membership. This company went bankrupt in the late 2000s following a data breach. So when and how did you first become aware of Clear the Company and the fact that it was something that you might be able to, to dive into? So Clear actually shut down, I think, really because of the economic downturn okay. and the cost structure and the fact that debt was due in the middle of a financial crisis and I don't think people were really recapitalizing companies. And Less so the data breach, in other words. In fact, it wasn't one. There was a lost laptop, but it is, if you Google it, that's what it says. But in fact, it wasn't one. And But I think there were really important lessons on that about how you structure data and the importance of cybersecurity even way back then. Mm -hmm. And I think it left a lasting impression on us and really helped form our culture. Mm -hmm. But the thing that we were really passionate about was the ability for biometrics to change the way people live, work, and travel. Biometrics were big outside the U.S. in 2009. In fact, they were used for Brazil for voting in Asia for financial services, in the U.S. more for the defense industry, and we believed in the consumerization of biometrics, that it was the and of making experiences safer and easier. They had a great idea. Steve Brill had a great idea in public-private partnership uh, with the Department of Homeland Security and changing the way people travel. It had to get better in a post-9-11 environment mm -hmm. and had to get safer. Biometrics and clear were part of that solution. Okay, but the relationship with the government, with Homeland Security was already in place Correct. by the time that Clear ended up folding. You've said that Clear was basically shut down in storage when you decided to buy it. So what exactly did you end up buying? We ended up buying a brand. Mm -hmm. We ended up buying equipment, right? So the old kiosks that you saw with, as we say, trackballs and, and card readers, which was quite a few million dollars of equipment. We ended up buying, um, once everybody had opted in, the biometric data and, and biographic information of the 190,000 members. And uh, we ended up buying a hard drive of what to do and what not to do um, in order to rebuild the company. And the deal, was, it was rocky to get through it, right? Because it took a while. Um, even after you won the, bank, the, the company in bankruptcy auction, 
it took a while because creditors were coming out of the woodwork and you were dealing with lots of things that just kept popping up all over the place. Yeah, people always say that uh, bankruptcies get settled on courtroom steps, and that is true, <laughs> right? There's a lot of different stakeholders who yeah. you know all want something, and so it's never as smooth as you think. What we thought we had won in February of 2010 actually didn't close till late April of 2010, and, and those things take a while. They take a while, so I just wonder at any point, did you think to yourself, oh, why did we do this? We should have just built something from scratch instead of buying this and having to deal with the problems that keep cropping up left, right, and center. We did think about that, and we thought about the equation of buying versus building, and we actually weighed that as things got really rocky. But in fact, members, while there weren't a ton of them, Almost 200,000. Uh, almost 200,000 were extremely passionate about the Clear experience. You could read mm -hmm. how sad they were in the newspapers, uh, you know, of, of Clear going away. And I think that said something. I think they built a brand that resonated with the consumers. And to have to rebuild it and then tell people, you know, that this is a different company, but it's kind of like that company. It was like, let's buy that and rebuild it. Okay, so there's a lot of goodwill with the customer base already. It was a known entity. What were your first steps after you acquired the company? I mean, was it talking with TSA? Was it just making contact with all the different airports and saying, okay, we're here, we're, 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 we're doubling down, tripling down? Yeah, I think a really important piece of business that I learned in asset management and carried over to Clear and really drive through our entire organization is the power of relationships that mm. build trust. Mm -hmm. And so, in fact, when we were looking at buying Clear, we went and we met with folks in Washington, in government, at airports, at airlines, to better understand their perspective and their experiences. And then as we bought it, I think the first thing, uh, we still have it, is a five-page double-sided to-do list uh, broken down into different aspects. And to really go out and share the story of what our vision was uh, of building a secure identity platform that today was in travel, but tomorrow would be the de facto platform for so many different industries changing the way people live, work, and travel. So we just kept going and sharing our vision mm -hmm. and how we uh, expected to accomplish it. And then really importantly, uh, we built, rebuilt the system from the ground up, but we also sent an email and communicated to members, mm. and we wrote that email ourselves to share our customer pledge, what we intended to do, to do right by them, and thank them for their membership, give them back whatever time they had as the company shut down, and promise to guard their privacy and give them great frictionless experiences. So it was really building trust with stakeholders, and we were doing something new. Still, biometrics weren't mainstream. Yeah. And then we're buying a bankrupt company in biometrics, and what does this girl know coming out of finance? So there was a lot of trust building and, and story sharing and then continuing to go back to those folks and share the progress transparently. What kind of biometric information did paying members give up or not give up, share with Clear versus what might they expect to share down the road that you communicated to them in this this in your constant communications with them. Yeah, so uh, when people enroll in Clear, it's in the airport, and mm -hmm. today outside the airport, it's a different uh, experience. It's fingerprint, iris, and face. Okay. And those are encrypted templates. They are really ones and zeros, not you know swirls and things of that nature, as I think people think in that sort of minority report way. <laughs> uh, but, and uh, that's what they share. and we promise to guard and secure their information and give them experiences. And so they're always sharing, they're always opting in, and uh, they always know what we're doing. So the old Clear had them paying an annual membership fee. The new Clear offers both free and paid products for customers to use at airports, but also at different venues like sports arenas, like restaurants, like museums. But obviously it's not free free. Someone's paying for it. If not the individual customer, then a business is paying for it. So explain how Clear works when the individual pays versus when a business pays. So at our core, we're a secure identity platform, right? Connecting you to all the things that make you you. The biggest customer on our platform is our travel vertical, which is a subscription-based business that a consumer would pay for or their company would pay a corporate right. membership, which we love. Um, but on the other side of that secure identity platform is connecting you to other things beyond your ID or your boarding pass for travel. It could be to your digital vaccine card or creating a health pass or to your age and credit card in order to buy a beer with your face because I am Karen and I'm over 21 and I can pay for this you know, beer so you can bring it to me at my seat. And so for those, our partners are paying. So it's either a subscription-based business by consumers or subscription by mm -hmm. enterprise or as people think of SaaS businesses. Right, how much of your business then is 
uh, paid by consumers, the subscriptions are paid by consumers versus by enterprises. Is it 50-50? So we don't share that as a platform because we do look at it holistically, but I mm -hmm. will say that the membership growth mm -hmm. on the platform side has been growing exponentially mm -hmm. over the past two years through COVID as we've come out with new products like Health Pass. Okay, I, I'm just curious, when people do sign up to be members, are there any times that you reject someone as a, as a paid subscriber? From an airport perspective, you do have to pass a, you know, a, KYC, a KBA, if you will, or what they call a quiz mm -hmm. that many of us have taken when trying to connect our identity for a mortgage or whatever the case may be. So um, if you do not pass that, then you cannot be a member in the airport. It's a small percentage of people. Okay. But it happens. But it does happen. So let's talk about travel in the airport because before we get into um, the investors like Delta, I, I just want to get your read on what you're seeing right now because you're in a really unique position, right? You have a read on what travel demand looks like and it's been up, it's been down. It's certainly recovered from last year at this time. And in fact, last year at this time, you had some pretty high hopes. Uh, you told Travel and Leisure that I see the back half of 2021 as being materially better than the front half. I'm very optimistic on this year, 2021. I'm optimistic on vaccines and I'm optimistic on people never wanting to travel more. And that did happen. That, that's what played <laughs> out. But we also had Delta, we had Omicron, which changed the trajectory of that demand. It was definitely not linear. So prognosticate for us how you see things shaping up in 2022 and how what happened in 2021 informs how you think about uh, making projections on what's to come. So clearly I'm a contrarian by nature when we buy a bankrupt company and I was saying that in early 2021. So I don't know if it's as contrarian, but right now in the middle of Omicron, I'm incredibly bullish on 2022. And we continue to see travelers traveling people have been locked down for going on two years. And we sit here today with vaccines, with boosters, with antiviral pills, and quite frankly, with a lot more data and knowledge around um, the pandemic, mm -hmm. which, you know, I think we're going epidemic to endemic. And I think that this is, a, you know, a new way of having to live with, um, you know, this pandemic. And people are learning how, you know, how we're going to be living with it for a long time. And so when I look at travel, I think that travel experiences are getting better. When you have to shut down, you got to come back better, which was actually one of our campaigns at the end of last year. But we see people uh, taking longer trips at Thanksgiving. They started leaving a week before they would normally leave. They are staying for uh, almost two times as long. They are in this world of digital nomads and hybrid work. We at Clear have worked from anywhere August. People are planning where they're going to work from. Mm -hmm. uh, we are back in the office, but there are definitely people who, as opposed to going away for three days for MLK, went away for four or five. So you can amortize you know, your airplane ticket over a longer stay. And so I think that in the world of Airbnbs and all these shared resources in travel, in the world of cruises and hotels shutting down and having to think how they make the experiences better, and I think having people stay home and be alone, people want to be together. They want to travel more than ever. I am more bullish on travel in 2022 than I am in 2021 because I do think uh, about 40% of our cities are up you're uh, over 2019, you're still seeing the coast down a little bit. Mm. And I think that's both international travel as well as historical business travel. And I don't really know what business travel is anymore. Cause that's it, what I was going to ask yeah. you next. Yeah, because business travel once upon a time meant going somewhere, flying 14 hours for a, I don't know, three hour meeting and then coming back, which right. is crazy now when you think about it. But now it could mean relocating somewhere for a couple of weeks or a couple of months. Or it could mean in a remote or hybrid work environment that you're someone who used to not travel and you were in New York, but now you're in Cleveland and yeah. you have to come back six times a year. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's a really extraordinary time and people need to redefine what it means to be a business traveler, a leisure traveler, as opposed to just a traveler mm -hmm. and a traveler who's staying in different places and want different experiences. Maybe you're staying at you know Yellowstone National Park for leisure travel and someplace else for what you used to define as business travel and is now being a digital nomad. And so I just think it's an extraordinary time. People want to travel and that once the coasts come back and international travel really comes back at full steam, I think you will see numbers significantly up over 2019 a lot faster than people think. Was there a dramatic uh, decrease in travel when Omicron first hit? And have you started to see that turnaround? We continue to see enormous strength in travel. 
So if you just look at this past holiday weekend, mm -hmm. I would say travelers were traveling. They might be traveling to warmer weathers. They might be traveling to places outside. I think it's been pretty proven that planes are as safe as any other place that you are, that you can go into a restaurant, sit inside or outside, you have more choices. Mm -hmm. All I can say is that travelers are traveling. It's been two years. And so I think that once people are vaccinated or boosted or choose not to be, and that's their own choice, people want to get back out. It's that pent up demand. Uh, Delta was once one of Clear's investors before you went public last year. Is that still the case? And I wonder how that, how you benefited from their being on your cap table. So Delta and United are both investors and great partners for Clear. And by, I always think of like having skin in the game. Mm -hmm. It really aligns the entire organization. And so it allowed us to integrate technology, whether it be working with United on getting uh, into a lounge with your face, so facial access into lounges, whether it be biometric boarding pass and your eyes or your fingerprints or not only your ID, but your boarding pass on integrating and working with our home to gate app, which allows you to know this is about frictionless experiences, exactly when to leave your home to get to your gate with 35 or 45 or 50, 60 minutes, whatever you want mm -hmm. um, ahead of time. We've partnered with Uber so that the you know car will come. It, it's it's about the frictionless experience. And so by partnering and integrating technology and being able to um, include their frequent flyers at discounted prices, it's been an extraordinary partnership, I think, for both sides and really creating value and driving innovation and customer experience. One thing that clear comes up often in conversations is that it is one of the ways that you can um, get a more frictionless experience going through security, for instance, along with TSA PreCheck and Global Entry, which are government-owned entities. What is it like being compared to these government-run services? I mean, you guys are a privately-run company, publicly held, publicly traded, but it's always said in the same breath. So we really believe in the power of partnership, partnership with Delta United, partnership with the Department of Homeland Security. So in fact, we've partnered with TSA and we'll be bringing PreCheck to travelers this year. And oh, so you'll be able to enroll any at any of Clear's enrollment locations, open from early in the morning to late at night with no appointment and enroll. You'll be able to integrate it in a bundle uh, with Clear. So we really love how TSA and the Department of Homeland Security, CBP, have been thinking about innovation. Travel has to become more frictionless. We have to leverage innovation together. And so we love PreCheck and in fact, um, our members who have clear plus pre-check think at some level it's like peanut butter and jelly. So Okay, it's so there, it's, it's going to be less distinct from one another going yeah, forward. It's about a holistic experience. Pre-check is really the ability to keep your coat and shoes on and change the physical screening experience. Yes. And so the two together are powerful and we're really excited to bring it to travelers this year. We think as you look over the next decade, travel is going to be much more frictionless, leverage much more innovation. If you look outside of travel, whether it be food delivery or ride share, it's changed dramatically, really through the power of technology enabling it. Mm -hmm. And so we see the same thing in travel. So my husband signed up to become a clear member when he was in SFO and he saw the line, it was a mile long and he was like, ah, oh, I might not make my plane. So then he signed up on the spot. What percentage of customers do you acquire this way? Um, those who are there and at the last minute realize that if they want if they want to get to their seat on time, they've got to they've got to do something. So about seventy percent of our members in the travel business enroll at the airport, mm. and so I think it's both top of mind. I don't think people are thinking about airport security five days or three months before they're going to be traveling. If at all, versus <laughs> if you're going skiing, you might buy a sweater. You know, right. months before. And so that opportunity to see it and to understand the technology. And I think one of the great gifts about Clear is that we have an incredible team on the ground in airports, ambassadors, and they really bring technology to life. So going back to biometrics, it was a new thing. It's less new today than it was. And so having incredible, hospitable people right, really focus on hospitality, the customer experience and security, be able to bring that technology to life and share it is game changing when someone gets to the airport and feels cared for. So it's both our ambassadors and our technology and it's a great place for people to enroll in less than five minutes and go right through. And seeing is believing, right? So we offer free trials at airports because mm -hmm. just like any other consumer subscription based business today, they want you to try it, right? You didn't think Netflix, you needed to stream or Spotify, you had enough music, but the ability to try new things 
is is material. And then that satisfaction leads him to stay on that subscription. You then share the revenue from uh, the new members who sign up at the airport with the airports that you operate in, yes? Yes. And can you tell us a little bit more about that? How many airports are you working with and how did that, that program develop over time? So today we're in 40 airports and growing. And again, we really think of ourselves as, as part of the Part of the fabric of the community in airports, right? We are serving members in frictionless experiences. We're serving airports and helping their constituents get through. And also, if you're getting onto the other side happier, you're more likely to buy your food, your beverage, whatever the case may be. Um, we're working with the Department of Homeland Security, right, to enhance safety. And so we really think of it as the glue. Our airport partners paying them a percentage of our revenues mm -hmm. uh, allows them to reinvest in their airports and continue to make the experience better. And so they're great partners. Our first one was Orlando. The highest percentage of first-time travelers go through the Orlando airport, which makes sense when you think of Disney World, et sure. cetera. And, uh, and so we love our airport partners and, and really being able to understand their needs and then figure out solutions and products that can help enhance both the customer and the employee experience. What about partnerships with foreign airports? Uh, we are not yet in foreign airports with our uh, clear plus lanes, and mm -hmm. we think that there's a big opportunity. We just made our first acquisition in Argentina in this virtual queuing business, which is far beyond airports, has some airport business. Um, so in Argentina, Brazil, Mexico, Canada, we are expanding and really excited at the opportunity because we're all this global interconnected world. Yeah. Sounds good. Aviation is still your biggest vertical, but I know you've talked about how in the future you want to make that your smallest one because you see so much opportunity elsewhere, notably in healthcare. How quickly is the healthcare vertical growing? The healthcare vertical is growing rapidly, partially with the innovation around what we've done in Health Pass and really giving uh, individuals the ability to have access to and control of their healthcare information. Mm -hmm. Your vaccine or your test information is just the beginning. And so we, you know, identity is foundational. When you think of all the times that you are taking out the cards in your wallet or, or trying to show your attributes, insights, loyalty, fandom, employee, um, you know, for an employee discount or to get into a building employee status, I should say, uh, we see identity as foundational. And when you think about healthcare and you think about the cards and you think about the information and you think about the payment and the bills that come after and the white envelopes that you don't really know what they're for, we think that there's enormous opportunities when you look at clears mission to make experiences safer and easier, frictionless and trusted. Healthcare with a regulatory back end, which we're very used to, to dealing with from a travel perspective and partnering with, but also changing the customization. And there's a huge push to the consumerization of healthcare. Yeah. So starting with Health Pass, and we were actually in healthcare, very small. We actually launched it about two weeks before March 11th, 2020. And that had to do with people going to see a doctor in Phoenix and being able to check in by using a facial scan rather than handing over all of their different cards, their insurance card and filling out all the forms with the clipboard, the dreaded clipboard. The dreaded clipboard. We want to replace the wallet. We want to replace the clipboard. We want to replace keys. And so it started there but then um, nobody was going to the doctor's office during COVID. <laughs> and what we saw with when we created Health Pass was that the vaccine card was gonna be the next card in your wallet and connecting people to their test results, mm -hmm. their vaccine information was going to be you know, incredibly important to help reopen the economy. And quite frankly, a sustainable trend going forward because how often are you filling out for schools, your child's vaccine information, whether it be- September's the worst month for parents. And so we've been doing that for a really yeah. long time and the opportunity um, to automate that in a safe way is definitely the future. So you mentioned the Health Pass. Do you have any evidence that the Health Pass has decreased rates of COVID spread in, in public places? I wonder if there's any data available on that. So I don't have data on how it might have decreased. I think people have said when you're vaccinated and you're boosted and the ability to prove that, and since we are a direct connection to that, I would assume that there's a deep correlation. But when we partnered with the Las Vegas Raiders, for example, and you know everyone used Health Pass to get in, I, you know, the outcomes are the Raiders games have been safe and they've been full and people have gotten back to their lives. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it's also given people the confidence to get back, you know, right, what environments you're entering, which is really meaningful for people. You sit on the board of the Department of Pediatrics at Mount Sinai Hospital here in New York. 
I wonder what you've learned from the medical professionals there, the experts there that help inform your approach to healthcare at Clear and what you can share with them to kind of inform how they proceed. So we are partnered with people like the Hospital for Special Surgery, HSS, here in New York. And when you spend time with these hospitals, they have incredibly hard jobs with lots of different stakeholders, and they are looking for innovation mm -hmm. to make it safer and easier. They are uh, looking to make their um, keep their employees safe, right? Mm -hmm. Staffing is a big thing. And so, again, when you think about healthcare and connecting uh, employees to both their uh, vaccination status, but also their certifications, whether it be telehealth, mm -hmm. right? Uh, there's all sorts of opportunities for both employees and patients in healthcare to make it frictionless. And when you look at how hard hospital workers have been working over the past two years. Uh, we at CLEAR had a Healthcare Heroes Dinner last year to really celebrate them. Mm -hmm. They are the heroes uh, of these past two years, and I think you gotta keep hospitals open, you gotta keep the costs down, which means automation, and you have to keep the experience better for patients. It's about making life easier for those who work at the hospital and those who have to go to the hospital as patients or as visitors of patients. And safer. Right? And safer. Easier and safer. And technology, clears technology as well as others, really helps bridge that and make it the end. You mentioned as well as others, and that's the thing because we don't have one system here. We have lots of different systems, and Clear's Health Pass is one option of many. You could look at it as a vaccine passport since we don't have an official vaccine passport here, here in the U.S., but then you could say that we have lots of different vaccine passports because, you know, New York State has something like a vaccine passport as well. What kind of oversight from the government do you think is needed when it comes to various ways of verifying someone's identity? I think standards are incredibly important, and there have been standards put forth, whether it be the Vaccine Credential Initiative, which CLEAR is a part of, as are so many different companies. And so I think standards and open systems that people then can subscribe to and be part of is really important. We believe in open systems, mm -hmm. and we also believe that the best form of competition is innovation. Mm -hmm. So continuing to innovate to serve customers, regulatory bodies, partners is is really important but i don't think that specifically in the world that we live in that this is you know one company doing it all these are about open standards that the government sets forth and then people meeting those standards has the government set enough standards that's a great question i think that the vaccine credential initiative and other initiatives that hhs have put forth have set standards both around identity and vaccine mm -hmm. So, I, you know, look, this is evolving. Mm -hmm. And I do think that paper cards are probably not the way of the future. And I think there is a recognition of identity and digital and smart QR codes. And those have been great standards that I think have been really important for consumers and safety. Okay, well, still waiting for the, the cardboard cards to go away. Um, data security, we've mentioned it and, and kind of touched on it a couple of times, but I wanna get a firm understanding here because you, how you hold access to a lot of people's information, information that people don't want to get out there. What do you do with the data that you collect on people who use your free app, who aren't paying for the service? So if somebody is on the free app and the partner is paying for the service, we are securing their face and their biographic information. Right? For the and partner. For the partner and for the member. Mm -hmm. And so that's encrypted at rest and in transit. And I think it's really important from both a data security and a privacy perspective. We are very clear, we will not sell or share your data. You are controlling your information. You can delete your information at any time. And in fact, when you have Health Pass, all you see is a green and a QR code, right? It's not all the information. And so it's really important to be very transparent with members mm -hmm. on what you have, on what you're doing with it, and we, in all bold, on our privacy policy, say we will not sell or rent your information. And that is foundational to clear. We believe in the end that you can create frictionless experiences and do it in a trusted way. So we've been big, big advocates from day one on privacy done right. But in your um, terms of service, I believe it, you do reserve the right to share the data with service providers. Can you explain what that means? Right. So that means if we have an internal billing company or something of that nature, so internal software that we're using 
to make clear run, mm -hmm. then that's the case. So that's purely internal for okay. operation's sake. Okay, got it. And again, I think that's a great example of just being very transparent in the privacy policy on any nits and nats and exactly what we're doing and how we're doing it. Mm -hmm. And it's also, it can't be 50 pages long and have people's eyes, you know, kind of roll over because they can't look, look at it. Look, I think that's a big problem details. today, which is these T's and C's are enormously long and people don't read them and you want to yeah. get to the bottom and you scroll through and we really, we've taken a paragraph up top we think it's in human talk, I say. Um, we want to be really transparent with people. I think that transparency builds trust in long-term relationships. I wonder if you find any divide or you've noticed anything in how uh, younger generations, Gen Z, millennials, approach privacy and share their data, their information, their health status, whatever, um, versus older generations. We have not seen differences in generations. What we've seen is, uh, it, from, a, from a sharing perspective, what we've seen is differences in generations from a utilization perspective. So historically, our travelers skewed slightly older. I say slightly older, still like younger than me. Uh, and of late with our Health Pass product, it skewed younger, but we're not sure if that's because you're going to a sporting event or a music festival or a restaurant because your younger people are going to that restaurant mm. or because younger people are more likely to be out and, and less afraid in this environment. Right, maybe we need more data on that before conclusions can be drawn or assessments can be made. Ultimately, from what our discussion has made clear is the problem you solve is making experiences, and that could be anything from flying to attending a hockey game to going into the hospital to visit a loved one to eating at a restaurant, safer, easier, and faster. Consumers have to have trust in your service that you're going to hold them, you're gonna to hold to these high standards. For our audience out there, many of whom want to start their own companies and want to have that, develop that kind of trust with their customers as well, how do you do that when you don't have a track record to fall back on? Uh, I believe you develop trust by walking the walk every single day. And, you know, I had a track record in a different business where I developed trust mm -hmm. and we had both investors and team members who then followed us to clear. Mm -hmm. And then it was also signing your name to it. So we put out um, a customer pledge in 2010 and one of the lines there says, we will guard your privacy and I signed my name to it. And then it's doing that every single day. I don't think that there is a silver bullet because somebody used to say to me that it's the staircase up and the elevator down, right? It takes a really long time to build a track record and can be very easily destroyed. And so it's day by day, action by action, words are cheap. It's the actions that you take. It's the partners that you partner with. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, uh, and then it's the consistency. And then it's driving that culture throughout the organization. When we started, there were two of us in a room, myself and our co-founder, Ken Kornick. And today we have almost 2,500 team members spread around the world. So it's every single person and it's building that culture, building block by building block and the consistency of it. I, I wish it was just, you know, as simple as snapping a finger. It's not. What was the biggest challenge you had in, in maintaining and, and, and recovering from any, I don't know, not doubts, but any instances where that trust may have felt like it was teetering a little bit? You know, I think it's really being out there with people. And so when a customer has a bad experience, they'll email me directly. We put our emails out there. It's not like we're hiding it. We will get back to them, mm -hmm. uh, myself, our member services team, quickly. Mm -hmm. That could be Saturday at 2 p.m. when I'm at my son's soccer game, right? We are obsessed with our member experience. And so that obsession and living it and showing your team members and going out and spending time you know, in the corner of Seattle to we have a team now, you know, in Israel, like you gotta go and you gotta build relationships, which is why Zoom has its merits. But I believe in travel and in person and building those relationships and you just gotta keep doing it, right? You gotta tell them, you gotta tell them again and you gotta just keep doing it every day. And showing up each time. And you have to live it yourself. Mm -hmm. I also wonder how much technology has helped in making people comfortable with um, sharing some of their information. Um, Apple started using fingerprint sensors and the facial recognition on the iPhone. That got people more comfortable with biometrics in a way that no amount of talk from, from anyone would have done. 
I, I believe in experiential learning. So whether it be Apple, whether it be going from hailing a cab to ordering a ride share, whether it be my mom would have never gotten groceries delivered to her house, but did during COVID. And once she experienced that, you really start thinking about productivity in a different way and why was I doing this before? And and so I do believe in the hybrid experience. Sometimes you go to the grocery store, sometimes you have it delivered. Sometimes you go to a restaurant, sometimes you have it delivered. And so I do think technology has changed people's experiences really over the past years when they were stuck at home mm -hmm. of willing to try new things, a Zoom birthday party or cocktail party, like you wouldn't have done that before. And so seeing is believing. Seeing is believing, and, and I mentioned iPhone. Um, Everyone uses their smartphones right now for ID verification, for the health pass um, by Clear. But the phone is really actually kind of a clumsy device, especially since we're wearing masks and you know you have to punch in your code anyway because the facial recognition doesn't recognize you. And we're on the cusp of accessing the metaverse with AR, VR gear whenever it comes around. What do you think tomorrow's device or method of accessing platforms will be? Because it's probably not going to be the phone in five years from now or 10 years from now, the way it is now. So I see the phone as a screen and it is right for watching things and, and it is one method. But the smartphone has been around for 14 years now. It's ancient. And like the pushing little squares as you get, you know, walking across the street, which I think is a terrible idea, is probably not the way of the future. And so our view is serving partners how they want to be served. That could be in the cloud, on the phone, that could be voice biometrics. If you are walking and have uh, some device in your ear and you say, "Order," I would like a, you know, Uber, it knows who you are, where you are. Again, you've opted into this and mm -hmm. that you could pay and maybe the driver wants to know that you're vaccinated or maybe you want to know that like, all sorts of things that's voice and 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 over to the network and so i think that there will be different ways to experience your universe physically or digitally but identity is foundational through all of it and that's face fingerprint eyes voice it could be your walk right they call it gate biometrics all sorts of things but i think that different experiences will require different devices or device lists. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You could walk into a building, there could be a teeny little camera and your face could be in the cloud. In some ways that's already happening in many places. Um, Always you, opted. <laughs> you, I, I wonder what it must be like for you to watch a movie like Minority Report or any other sci-fi tech movie where people are making predictions about the future and, and how you think about how applicable that is to what Clear does and what you might be venturing into next. So I look at James Bond's films, right, from way back when, and it was always about envisioning what could be. Yeah. And I love dreaming about the art of the possible, and then I love doing it in a way that's member-centric, that's privacy-centric, and that really is the and of frictionless and trusted. I think the next 10 years are going to be extraordinary, and technology enabling and so it's not just technology companies. I actually think it's technology enabling a better, safer, more productive life, whether that be an autonomous tractor, mm -hmm. right, which could, which we all read about coming out of CES, which now can, you know, plow for 24 hours a day. And so you have better farm productivity, which will yield better outcomes or more ag tech, right? And so you'll have, uh, you know, better farm, a better farming industry here. I think that it will be a really exciting time for people to live better, more productive, safer lives, um, getting them back to what they love. And uh, I also really deeply believe in the hybrid, that it is the physical and the digital, and that there's digital transformation of physical industries, but also merging it together. And that mm -hmm. people will be shopping in stores, but that that experience will be better. People will be traveling, but that that experience will be connected, and we're gonna help connect it. And so I'm incredibly optimistic and very bullish. All right. Um, you've said it's management's job to look around corners. You've survived 9-11, um, pivoted your business in the wake of the financial crisis. COVID obviously opened up new opportunities for you to really dig into healthcare in a way that you'd already just started. What do you see five years out for Clear? So I do believe it's management's job to look around corners. And I felt that as an investor. Mm -hmm. And I think you see the great management teams invest for the future and looking for high returns. And so what I see for clear is that you enroll once and use it, what I say, everywhere. And that really goes from what used to be 12 times a year to 12 times a day and making it your daily habit that you could leave your home and get into a ride share, get into your building. When you get into a building, your car, your coffee is delivered. Use it as your 
ticket to get into a game, buy a beer at your seat and have someone deliver it to you, place a bet, right? Because you're your age and your payment, have a materially different uh, healthcare experience that really is frictionless and delightful in person or, you know, through telehealth and that you get your time back and spend more time with your family and what you love doing and that we're delighting people and really changing the customer and partner experience. And surprising them from uh, what normally can be quite dreary going through all these steps. Friction-free life. All right, Karen, thank you so much. Karen Seidman-Becker is, of course, CEO, Chairman, and Co-Founder of Clear.